Um, thank you so much for joining Inspiring Session. And um, we're so glad to be here today um, to start our third edition of the Inspire series, which is um, a session where we are privileged to have women who have been successful in their career to share their story and journey with us. And today we're going to be having um, Ms. Aisha Rimi with us. And she will be sharing her journey, um, how she was able to overcome some challenges. And I hope that we, um, as all female lawyers, will be able to um, share one or two story or learn from her. Um, we are welcome to this edition. This is the third edition. And now I'm going to allow the chairperson of the MBA Women Forum, Mrs. Chinyere Okorocha, um, to give a welcome remarks. Um, over to you, Mrs. Chinyere Okorocha. It's not here. Is not okay. Um, I, I guess maybe she hasn't joined us, and maybe she would join. Um, so I will just give um a brief. Um, details about the advocacy committee. So we have the uh, one of the committees set up by the MBA Women Forum, and our vision basically is to support female lawyers in strengthening their voice on issues affecting them, raise awareness of those issues to mobilize others to act and influence policy development. And part of our programs are lighted for um, the committee um, is the establishment of female lawyer help desk and also the Inspire series, which as I stated earlier, um, is the series where we um, invite women who have been successful in their careers um, to share their milestones with us and also inspire us on the way to go forward in our careers. We also have seminars and training and the advocacy committee. And I would just allow um, our coordinator of the committee, Dr. Bukola, um, to just give us a short, um, um, information more about the advocacy committee. Over to you, Ms. Bukola, Dr. Bukola. Good morning. Thank you very much, Tolu. Um, I am very happy to give a brief profile on uh, Mrs. Aisha Rimi. Uh, Miss, Mrs. Aisha Rimi is a partner in the corporate, commercial, and private client practice group. She serves as vice chair of the section on business law of the Nigerian Bar Association, Nigeria's leading commercial legal practice association. She's a leading transaction lawyer versed in general corporate commercial law with expertise in foreign investment, regulatory compliance, and business advisory for doing business in Africa. Her areas of specialization and experience include project financing, corporate and operational joint ventures, all manners of commercial structures and advisory services, such as joint ventures, shareholder arrangements, manufacturing, licensing, and distribution agreements, divestments, mergers and acquisitions, corporate restructuring and governance, regulatory compliance. She also manages the firm's private client department, which offers services in trusts, wealth and estate planning, wills, and personal investment and advisory services. She has significant local and international experience as a project finance attorney at Chad and Park, now Norton Rose Fulbright in, the, in the, the United States, where she worked on infrastructure projects across sectors. Recently, she has led teams that advised on multi-million dollar investments 
in large infrastructure development projects, the restructuring of a multi-billion Naira facilities. She has also conducted value for money and legal audits. She has rendered business advisory and transaction structuring. She advi advises corporates and government agencies in areas of acquisitions, mergers, and private equity investments. With responsibility for growing the firm uh, involving the private client group, she has overseen the organic expansion of the service to include wealth and personal investment services. She is a major mega woman and we are happy to have Aisha Remy with us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Bukola. Um, so I can see that our chairperson is online now. I would like her to give her opening remarks before I hand over to uh, anchor for today, Oyeye Made Rigwe. Mrs. Chinere Okorocha is our chairperson for MBA Women Forum. Um, she's been the one leading us um, so far. So I will give her um, the platform to give her welcome remarks. Thank you, Mrs. Okorocha. Hello, ladies. Good morning. And... Um... I'm really delighted that you're all here today. I was grappling with my, my devices and that's how come I didn't log on before 10 o'clock, but I was here, uh, I guess till you didn't see me when you were saying, thinking I, I hadn't joined. So once again, ladies, welcome to today's event. I'm so excited to be here and welcome to this event organized by the um, Advocacy Committee of the Nigeria Bar Association Women Forum. I am particularly uh, excited today because um, we'll be hearing from um, someone who I consider to be a very successful female professional, um, albeit female lawyer. And if you know anything about me, you know I'm all for promoting uh, women, even as they try and rise in their careers, no matter what it is. And also the fact that female lawyers are indeed female professionals. And I really, really want us to start seeing ourselves not just as lawyers, but as professionals. And so that all the rules that apply to a female professional, even in big conglomerates, they really do apply to us. And so I'm hoping that as we share with Aisha today, she'll tell us her journey. You know, a lot of us, we see the finished product. You see a young, uh, you know, or old, as it were, female lawyer looking good, looking sharp, looking nice with her outfits, carrying a nice bag, wearing nice shoes. And all we see is the finished product. But that finished product took a journey to get to, there were scars, there were challenges, there were the nights that I'm sure she cried and there were some, some successes, but there were also tears. So I'm hoping she will share this journey with us so that we can learn and be inspired by her journey um, and the journeys of anybody else who chooses to share today. MBA Women's Forum, as you know, is a constitutionally, um, uh, instituted arm of the Nigeria Bar Association. Our association or our forum um, is meant to cater for the needs of the Nigerian female lawyer in terms of mentorship, in terms of uh, career development, in terms of achieving the work-life balance, ensuring that we're in leadership, honing our skills in anything it takes to rise up the career ladder for ourselves as female lawyers. And I am so delighted that MBA has us in this constitution to take particular notice of the needs of the female lawyers. Our slogan is empowering female lawyers for success. And I am <clears throat> certain that by the end of today, we will all feel empowered. Now, for those of you who may not know, who are not, members of the association, I'd want to use this opportunity that I have to speak to encourage you to join the Women's Forum. We hold programs like this um, that are empowering and inspiring and will help you in your own career journey. Because we are a national body, 
we have 36 uh, branches across the 36 states of the Federation in Nigeria. We call our 36 um, branches, we call headed by state leads. And then in each of the states of the Federation, we have what we call a branch a facilitator in all the 125 out of the 128 branches of the NDA. We also have 11 committees and each of our committees is headed by a committee head, a deputy and a coordinator. So if you put together, of course, we have our governing council that has an ESCO. We have distinguished uh, uh, council members, erudite members of our profession. And so when you put all that together, you see that the leadership structure of the MBA WF is nationwide. Whether you're in Kano, whether you're in Akwaibom, whether you're in Taraba, whether you're in Oyo or Ogun State or River State, um, you will be able to find a branch of a noble association or forum and be able to join and participate. If I could ask our administrator, Wanne, to please post the registration link on the link for this webinar, I just saw a pop a message pop up where someone asked, how can she join? We also have a website, MBA Women Forum. So that is www.mbawomenforum. Is it ng or org? Someone correct me. When they also type it in the box, if you click on, go to our website, the information about joining the association is there also. Uh, registration or membership is free. Uh -huh, .org .ng. Thank you. <laughs> now, registration is free if you're zero to five years at the bar. It is absolutely free. You don't need to pay anything. However, if you are five years and above, then you will pay a, a nominal 5,000 Naira, just 5,000 Naira to join the association. And this, ladies, is a yearly fee. So once again, I use this opportunity to welcome you all to this uh, program today. Let us sit, let us listen. I encourage you to please participate freely. You are here to share your own challenges. I guess you will pick all the pen and paper, ladies. Um, to listen and to take down notes and to find which part of this story resonates with you personally, um, even on your own career journey. I want to use this opportunity to thank Aisha Rimi for agreeing to give us her time this, after, this early morning uh, when she could be in some high powered negotiation or transaction on behalf of her firm. We are grateful. And, and welcome, and we welcome you here today. So back to you, Tolu, or is it uh, Oyeyemi, whoever? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Okorocha. Um, we are always glad to have you, and thank you for leading us. So without wasting too much of our time, I will just hand over to Oyeyemi um, to take over from here. Over to you, Oyeyemi. Thank you so much, Tolu. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. O, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Bukalauchi. And of course, welcome, Ms. Rimi. We're so, so excited to have you this morning. Um, we have questions that we have listed, but to the house, I would ask you to please drop your questions as they arise. We'll be monitoring them. And at the end of the discussion, we will try to squeeze in as many questions as we have. Um, so before we go into the questions, I would just share a personal experience with um, Ms. Rini that I have. Um, we both sit, <laughs> we both sit on the council of the section of business law. And one of the meetings that we had, um, we were discussing funding for one of our conferences and funding hadn't gone as expected and a request was made to her to intervene and just help. And she didn't, there was no force, there was no drama, no, it was just a simple, oh yes, more like I've got it handled, don't worry. And by the time the report came, we had overrun 
our target by almost, I think it was 70 or 80%. And everyone was so excited, but there was, it was not, it was, you could bat through. She didn't even act like anything had happened. And I just kept asking myself, how is she so calm? Like she just walked a miracle. <laughs> she just took us out of the woods. How is she so calm? Then I, the second question I asked was, how did she even do it? If you know anything about organizations like the MBA and even not for profit organizations, advocacy organizations, it is tough to raise money. And so that was my first initiation into the silent power house that she is. And I, I, I hope that she gives us some tips so that we can catch that bug and work the same miracles in our own spheres <laughs> sometimes. So welcome, Ma, we're so excited to have you. Um, first question that um, is on our lips is, how did you find law? For most people, they stumble into law. You know, they, they they didn't like math or something happened and they just, so how did you get into this law verse that we all live in? Wow, good morning. Good morning, everybody. My dear sisters, Mrs. O, Dr. Bukola, uh, thank you, uh, Oyeyemi. Thank you very much for having me. I have to say that I am honestly humbled. I am um, I'm quite surprised. And I was listening to them read out my, my, my bio and I was like, are they really talking about me? And I think this is one of the things that a lot of women suffer from. We tend to be very um, uh, brutal with ourselves. But um, I again, I'm very humbled. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very pleased. I hope that whatever it is that I'm able to share in the next 45 minutes will inspire, <clears throat> excuse me, will inspire one or two people um, to, to really face, um, to face their career and, and their personal lives with, with as much, uh, you know, zeal and resilience and perseverance that I've come to learn over the years. So to answer, to, to answer your question, how did I stumble into law? I think I grew up at a time when um, your parents pretty much dictated exactly what it is that you were going to do or what you were going to become. Um, academically, it was very clear that I was never going to be an accountant. I was not going to be a doctor. It, it was very clear from, from, from an early stage. So, and uh, my mom would say stuff like, hey, all this talking, talking, go and channel it into something constructive. You know, you're always arguing. And stuff. But in any case, then you, you were either sort of like an art or a science student. Um, so that was pretty clear for me that um, it was going to be something along those lines. Um, my father, on the other hand, was very calm. And, you know, he gave me a whole rational discussion about how law was very good, um, a very good uh, uh, foundation for most things in life, um, except the sciences, of course. And, and so off I went um, to study law and um, even though in the beginning I was a bit sort of, um, you know, and today we have suits. I don't know if people have watched suits. In those days, we had something called LA law. So law was very, if I may use the word, very sexy, very, you know, you know, people would get up, they'd go to court, they'd talk, they'd make all these fancy arguments and the judges would actually listen and, you know, commend them and stuff. So that's, that was my image or impression of law, but um, it, the, the reality wasn't quite that. But needless to say, um, I, I was, I was, um, I was, co I was directed towards law. Um, I don't think I've had any serious regrets about studying law, and I'm actually very grateful for the, for, for that opportunity. So that's how I stumbled onto it. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Matt. So I'll yeah. flip the script a little, and I would ask. Could you just walk us through starting the middle? Certainly you're not at your peak because <laughs> we, we know that you have so much more under your belt, but how has the journey been? What, I mean, what has kept you going? You know, you found law and then, you know, continued in it. So how has it been, you know, what was, what's the story? that we don't often hear. Okay. Um, well, okay, so when I, uh, when I,
finished law, um, I, I ended up doing a master's as well. Um, and it was because I was so young. I think I was about 20 at the time. And my parents were like, we'll just do the master's, everything. And so when you come back to Nigeria, you know you're back and you know you go straight into law school and, and, and you start your career. So I was very lucky, very privileged at the time to have been in, um, in what was probably one of the top most firms, and certainly top five. And, and this was 32 odd years ago. Um, I, and it was Ajumagubia, Okeke, Oyebode, and Aluko. And as you know, they were probably the unicorns of their time and certainly in, in legal practice. So I was privileged, like I said, to go in there as a youth corpa. Um, I was retained. I stayed there for about um, 10 years. And in those 10 years, um, and you know, when you're going through this grueling process, you never quite realize the lessons that you learn until you actually leave or later on a retrospect. You look back and you realize, well, oh, that's what they were trying to teach me. So the first few years, um, they, they made us do everything. I mean, you did everything from making tea to being a driver to sitting in meetings and taking notes and being told, speak only when you're spoken to. Um, I mean, you, you, you took it all. Um, if I were a millennial, then I would probably be in therapy today. But, um, <laughs> but you know, all those lessons all those things that they, they imbibed in us. I, at the time, it was, very, it, could, it, it was very frustrating at times. I think somebody talked about tears. There were lots of tears. Um, you also had to do um, everything, litigation, filing, going to the lands registry, the whole gamut, corporate work. Um, I didn't really like litigation because, of course, the hours were endless. The, the work was grueling. You'd go to court. You'd sit there for hours. It, it would be hot. The judges would shout at you. Senior lawyers would intimidate you. Um, you know, um, there were lots of adjournments and stuff. But, you know, further down the line, I realized these were all sort of character building experiences. And so when you talk about me being calm, it's because there's nothing I really haven't seen. Um, certainly in, in this profession and on this journey. So fast forward, I was there for about 10 years um, and I was, I was um, probably one of the uh, core or founding staff members. So I went from youth core to up to 10 years and um, I ended up being a partner. Um, and then I got an opportunity to go to New York to work as a visiting attorney at a New York firm. Um, and again, I realized now that if it wasn't for those 10 years of, of hard labor that I put in, I wouldn't have had the experience, the knowledge, or even the ability to, to have been even considered for that sort of position. So that was a very interesting um, year, which I spent in New York. It was unfortunately the year of 9-11. So I got to New York, very excited, happy, you know, going to live this corporate life, this LA law meets New York, you know, with my Lagos Agidi. And then, um, and then boom, 9-11 happened. So that, you know, that sort of, that affected not just um, New York as a place, but certainly the, um, the, 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 the world. Um, you know, everybody became paranoid, nervous, work took, um, the world economy took a nosedive. Uh, but it was still, nevertheless, an interesting year where, you know, I was able to sort of understand and appreciate and, and learn um, uh, values of, of working in an international law practice. Um, whilst I was there, I then um, met a, a company, a consulting company that was doing um, government relations work um, essentially advising U.S. companies that were doing business across Africa. And they had always been on the lookout for uh, professional Africans because they're like, we're Americans and people come to us, they need help because they had contact with African governments and also uh, on, uh, in, in the D.C. area on the Hill with, with um, uh, organizations like uh, Corporate Council on Africa, Council of Foreign Relations, um, the White House, all of that. So they were looking for Incredible um, professional Africans. And again, if I hadn't had, like I said, those 10 years um, from, from, from my firm in Lagos um, this year in New York, I don't think I would have been considered. So um, that put me in a completely different um, professional environment, which, like I said, was government relations. 
and um, uh, and and advocacy work. So I ended up moving to Washington D.C. I helped them set up an office there, and uh, pretty much ran it along with a couple of other professionals. And I was there for four years. But um, and this was before Japa was fashionable. But but you know I I'd, I'd only planned to be away for a year. So really after about four years, believe it or not. I was anxious to come back home, and um, as as wonderful and as, as exciting as life abroad may seem, it just wasn't home. So I came back. I came back to Nigeria, but this time I came back into Abuja. And in Abuja, I decided that I'd had that I now had enough experience to be able to work for myself, by myself, and 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 run an organization the way I felt it should be run. So. Um, I became a boutique law practice, so to speak. Um, I did the work that I enjoyed doing. If I didn't want to do anything, I would, I would actually sometimes take on assignments. But then I would go to senior colleagues or other colleagues and say, "Look, I've got this assignment." Sometimes it would be litigation, which by now it was very clear I was not going to be a litigator. And I would say, "Look, I've got this. I don't want to turn it down. There's um, stuff to be learned, money to be made. Can you help me?" So I would partner with people for particular assignments, whatever they might be. Um, again, fast forward. Um, so I did that for a while. Um, and, and in between this, and I'll probably talk about it at some other point, like most people, they say never have one stream of income. So I had many different side hustles that I was, that I was doing as well. But law was the core and law was the anchor. Law was the hub and everything else was the spoke. Um, and, and I realized that everything that I did, if I didn't have the experience and the knowledge of being a lawyer, I would probably have failed at some, at some of those other things, regardless of what they were, even just buying and selling and trading. Uh, you know, it, it, um, law had given me this, this outlook and this background and this um, knowledge to be able to, 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 to deal with those um, other um, uh, ventures. So fast forward uh, again, I then met up with, with uh, an old um, senior colleague who was also a brother and a friend uh, who was now, this is Mr. Shashare, SAM, who was now setting up a new practice. And this new practice was um, going to be slightly different because, you know, over the we had worked together in Ajumagobia and Ukeke, and then, of course, we all went our separate ways. So this practice... Um, was designed to be a pan-African law firm that would be able to provide services across the continent because we saw that the continent was now clearly becoming um, a, more of an open marketplace. You have the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement coming uh, um, Association coming into force. Uh, there was a lot of inter-African trade. You saw banks expanding. You saw um, companies, uh, Nigerian companies, certainly setting up in other countries. So we thought, you know what? Why is it that when um, these uh, companies or these uh, uh, financial institutions or, or organizations, when they want to set up, they'll go to London, look for a firm, the firm will come, uh, uh, then appoint a, a, you know, a local firm to do the work and stuff like that. Why can't we do it? Why can't we corporate? If we don't grow this, in, this, uh, this industry ourselves, nobody's ever going to do it for us. So it's about collaboration. It's about expansion. It's about looking inwards into the continent. So... It was very exciting. And the um, other partners that um, we have were also people that I knew and I respected professionally and, and, and on a personal level. So that was very easy for me um, to take on. And um, that was how we started Africa Law Practice. And this was about six years ago. And um, the other thing which we do, which may, some people may or may not know, is we also set up what, what is called the professional services arm. So professional services. So um, gives tax advice, um, audit, uh, well, audit a separate um, business consultancy and advisory, because we found again that um, our clients were looking for convenience. They want a one-stop shop. They don't want to come to you and, you know, okay, I'm going to Tanzania, I need this, but then guess what? Here I have a local tax issue or I, need, I have an audit problem or I need some business advisory, I need some training even. And so we thought, well, you know, we're giving off um, services that we can actually provide. Well, not us uh, as individuals, because we're not qualified, but certainly we can set up a structure 
that is able to provide that. So we have ALP Professional Services Limited, which which provides that. We are shareholders. We we um, we acquired a local um, accounting firm that had been in existence for years, and we you know we 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 uh, um, we reconstructed it um, to look and, and feel like us and to be able to provide those services. So our clients are able to have a one-stop shop when they come to us. And, uh, and I guess that kind of brings me to where I am now. And you see, I'm not at my peak. I'm tired. <laughs> I, I'm tired, but yeah, I think I still have a few more years left in me. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. That's so inspiring. I mean, first thing that, people at the t- one thing I picked up which is interesting you set up a law firm at a time that women weren't going into entrepreneurship that is running their own law firms it wasn't common um that speaks to a lot of courage but let me piggy bank on the 10 year um part of the story where you talk about yeah. how you honed your skills um Certainly, one thing I picked up is preparation, right? But what are the other skills that you think are essential, especially, um, and maybe you could add a twist to it in terms of as what women should focus on using our traits, our uniqueness. What are the skills that we need to build, you know, to be formidable um, as professionals? Okay. Um... I, I would call it my three P's, patience, perseverance, and prayer. And from that, we can sort of, you know, like just e- extrapolate a, a whole bunch of things. First of all, you have to persevere. Um, this is a very, very, and like most professions, um, you know, it's very testosterone driven. Men have taken over, like they come in and take over a whole bunch of things. And the truth is, they, um, you know, they expect us to crumble, to 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 um, to retreat. They will use their outdoor voice. They will intimidate you. They will talk down. At you. you will see. Um, you will come across many different kinds of behaviors, which are really not designed to encourage to encourage you. And I think the reason men do that is because they know that the minute you encourage a woman or support a woman, she will do better than you. So honestly, I'm I'm telling, I'm, I'm so convinced about that. And that's why, so it's, it's, it's a defense mechanism that they have. So the minute they intimidate you and, and our natural instinct is to cower, you know, in our case, also in this country, we also have a cultural issue. So it might, I, I was talking, to, sorry to just digress for a second. I was talking to a, uh, some lawyer yesterday trying to sort out a very simple landlord tenant issue. I didn't know him, but I thought, you know what? There's a, there's a lawyer on the other end. Let me talk to him and let me just calm him down. Uh, this tenant had not paid her rent and, you know, was trying to exit the property without having paid for three months and stuff. So I start talking to him on the phone. And he starts shouting and he's yelling and he's intimidated. And I said, sir, why are you shouting? Don't call me, sir. I'm an Otumba. I'm 27 years at the bar, blah, blah, blah. I said, eh, okay, sir. Call me Hajia. And please note, I'm 32 years at the bar. And that's not the point. You have to, woman to woman, can't you just help her? So he immediately changed tack. But, you know, he had come at this in a very aggressive manner because I was, if I was a guy, there's no way he would have started the conversation like that. So it's it's about being patient, persevering, being absolutely professional in everything that you do. Um, um, And it comes from your appearance, from how you communicate, from, uh, um, you you know, just your general demeanor. You've also got to be prepared. You have to be prepared at any given point so that even if they don't... um, they 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 emit they they don't uh, they will be forced to listen to you because you are prepared and you know exactly what you're talking about and 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 you know I'm sure most of us here have had experiences where we go to meetings and we say something and nobody kind of listens and then a guy says exactly the same thing and everybody's like yeah hey that's exactly what I was thinking so you've got to <laughs> you you have to be prepared 
you have to be firm, you have to always be, um, uh, and, and, and preparedness also gives you confidence because you're able to then stand your ground and make the points that you do want to make. And you have to also not be emotional. You can't afford to be emotional because there's that expectation that, oh, this is a woman and, you know, she's just, you know, if we, if we shout enough or, or talk over her head enough, she'll, she'll, she'll cower down. And then most women will then sort of return. They're like, okay, it's all right. The man is my senior or he's a guy or whatever. No. And, and so that, um, those I think are the sort of the core um, um, uh, uh, um, pillars that we should work with and then extrapolate from that. Um, I hope that kind of That's only very question. helpful. You even went okay. beyond the three Ps. Um, there's someone who's helping us even put down what you're saying in the comments and apparently, oh, really? <laughs> yes, communication, you know, yeah. and this point on not being emotional, um, Thank yeah. you so much, Matt. I, I, I think um, it's a good time to ask one of the questions that I know would be on everyone's lips. Um, and speaking of emotional, women, because of culture, were constructed to have certain roles ascribed to us. And so oftentimes our personal lives intercept with our aspirations at work. So we are either contending or compromising or losing out or you know feeling cheated, being shortchanged, whatever the case. I think, what are your perspectives on how women can wield power in this space? That is, deal with the intersection between personal life and work properly. And what are the priorities that they should you know, focus on? in dealing with this? Is my question clear? Yeah, I think what you, in a nutshell, is how do you strike a work-life balance? Um, or, or how do you, how do you um, maintain your professionalism or, or your career path without letting the other, um, um, the personal side of things suffer? So, yes. yeah, I, I think that's kind of it in a nutshell. So, well, you know, Again, um, we are blessed as women. We're able to be many different things. We're able to be professionals. We're able to be um, mothers. We're able to be caregivers. And I, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday and she said, I'm tired. I said, oh, what did you do today? She said, no, it's not about today. I'm just tired of my life. I'm tired. I, everybody is pulling from me and I'm, you know, and I feel that I'm just giving up. And I said, but don't you think that it's better that they're pulling from you than you trying to extract from somebody else? Because it then means that you're strong, that there's something that people actually see in you that they're able to pull from. So let's take it as it's draining. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's exhausting, but it's actually, you know, it, it's a blessing when you look at it, um, if it's handled properly. Now, like everything that we do, you know, you hear about, oh, if you're going to eat, eat in moderation, if you're going to do that. So it's about balance. It's about balance and it's about creating those opportunities that are able to, to help one to, um, to progress with one without the other suffering. Now, you know, we, uh, and maybe I can speak for Mrs. O here, um, uh, I'll take the liberty of speaking for her. We went through practice and, um, and growing up in, in this environment without necessarily having support um, in terms of um, our offices. Uh, 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 and, you know, at the time, I was certainly very angry. When I got pregnant, my office didn't even have a maternity provision. They were like, so what do we do? So, so you're going, I mean, so, and then what, you know? And I had to go through this whole negotiation process and, you know, about, okay, you know, the six weeks before, six weeks after, but, you know, I'm going abroad. And then, that, okay, eventually we arrived at something that allowed me to go off, but then I didn't get full pay and I got only, you know, basic. Then there used to be this dichotomy between basic pay and allowances and all of that. It, it, was, it was just honestly quite um, very interesting, but they hadn't had to deal with it. And I hadn't had, I, I obviously had never worked anywhere else. So... We talk about balance, um, and I think things have improved a lot. Um, and if I could use my office as, as an example, first of all, um, 
we do not penalize anybody for wanting to take time off to do the things that they need to do, which is if you're getting married, if you're having a baby, if you're having um, child care issues, whatever you are, you can. T- and, and, and if one thing that has come out of COVID is it has shown us the ability to be able to work remotely. So we do not penalize anybody. We make sure that everybody stays on track because we realize that it, it would be unfair. You would essentially be having two classes or two categories of employees if you did not allow women to be able to focus on those things that are important to them um, um, because we have biological clocks as well. So, and you see some people sort of, you know, lose out on that because they're so busy focusing on their career. Nobody should be penalized for having to do that. Um, So in fact, what we've done is, I remember there was a lady going on maternity leave and she had been, um, she had been penned down for promotion. So there was this whole debate about whether we promote her when she comes out. Oh, what if she doesn't come back? What if her baby takes her time and she's unable to come back? But we went ahead anyway. So she got her promotion before she went on maternity leave, continued to get um, her, her allowances or whatever, um, came back, and, and we actually set up a crash. We've set up a crash now in our office. Um, it's it, it's um, a fully kitted crash so that those women, because we have a lot of women in that category, in that age bracket, who are starting families. And so they're able to, so we have nursing mother hours, um, we have the crash so that they're able to bring their babies to work. Um, and um, if they have days when they can't be in the office, we allow them to work remotely. So we, we've, we've, like I said, one of the reasons for starting ALP was to create the kind of firm that I would have liked to work in. And now that I have the opportunity, I've been able to do that. So to go back to the question in general, I think people, uh, women, need to be, women need to be bold. They need to be able to ask for what it is that they want, because you realize that if you don't ask, you will never get. A lot of these places, they've never had to deal with some of these issues. And so they don't know. But if you, uh, if you make a clear, concise um, argument or, or presentation about your expectations, um, if you are, you know, I, I, I think most firms or most organizations would be reasonable. Of course, they're constrained sometimes for financial reasons or space or whatever. Not everybody is able to. But I think... Um, people should be bold enough and brave enough to ask for what it is that they want, like I said, in, in, a, in a very sort of um, professional and, and uh, um, um, cons- uh, you know, uh, in, a professional, in a professional manner. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. That was very good. Um, yeah. I don't know if you're seeing the comments, but you have so many. No, people. I'm trying not to be. I'm I'm trying not to be distracted. I keep seeing things Please popping don't. up. <laughs> it's good. It's a lot better you know, that way. At, at my um, age, if I look at something else, I'll lose my train of thoughts. <laughs> okay, so you said something earlier about side hustles, and yeah. for a lot of women, that's something that we wonder about. What is appropriate yeah. to do? How? I mean, this is not even from the professional uh, we want to hear your personal perspective and why uh you've taken that approach because it appears that it has enriched your life in terms of personal um access and all of that so please just share what your perspective is on at this side hustles and multiple streams of income i wrote it down (laughs) okay well i think you know life happens right and things come your way and you really have to be, you know, when I talk about perseverance, you also have to be resilient. So uh, people go into side hustles for many different reasons. One, it's not some uh, purely economic. Some do it because they enjoy it, you know, whatever it is that they want to do. So you've got to define what it is that you are looking for. Are you looking for something that um, is going to enrich you, bring in some money, um, whatever, or are you going to do something, you know, some people can be Zumba teachers and it doesn't bring in a lot of money, but they get excess, they, they're able to do their exercise and, and make, uh, you know, whatever it is on the side. But 
you've got to define what it is that one, you're interested in, two, that you're good at, and that you will make an impact, um, however small. Um, and you can't be everything to everyone. So you've got to be intentional about what it is that you're going to do. And of course, if, like in my case, law was always my focus, I was never going to let anything sort of distract me too much from being able to respond to my clients' needs, but also some, not something that would um, conflict with my professional ethics. So, you know, it, 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 like I said, you've got to find, so I, I, I did real estate, um, and, and I'm not just talking about landlord, tenant, but, you know, actually developing projects, because for some reason, I think now if I hadn't been a lawyer, I might have been not necessarily an architect, maybe an interior architect. I like to take spaces and transform them. So I found that I have an interest in that and there was money to be made. So I, you know, come and, and literally, I think my son called me Bob the Builder um, at some point. But, you know, so, so there's that. I also um, ventured into the catering business, which was from outdoor catering to, to actually setting up a restaurant. Um, you know, but again, um, at some point, some of these things take a toll on you and you've got to decide what it is that, you, you know, you really want to do. So or, or, or what makes you happy and if it's if it's worth it. Um, so be true to yourself. Like I said, make sure it's something that you're good at, something that doesn't necessarily conflict with your personal and professional um, 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 ethics and, 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 and uh, um uh, yeah, your professional ethics, essentially. Fantastic. Thank you yeah. so much, Ma. I, I, I hope we all heard that. So from volunteering to interior decor, whatever your interests are, as a lawyer, yeah. you can live a rich life as a female lawyer. Yeah. And that rich life is not in terms of money, it's in terms of expression, you know, expressing mm -hmm. yourself. Thank you so much, Ma. Uh, there are people here from Sokotoa, and I've seen someone else from a couple of northern states mm. um, and while we don't have those leanings you know because we're a professional mm. organization but we cannot ignore that um, there's not a lot of representation from our sisters from the north in terms of professional experience exposure and all of that what do you think are the peculiar challenges that they face and um, what are the tips for success that you have um, maybe not just the North, even people who are not necessarily in high commercial areas or exposed to uh, heavy transaction work and all of that. What are your tips for success for um, those block, uh, that block of our sisters um, in the profession? Okay, um, so I'm, I'm as um, some people may or may not know, and I keep getting, but you don't look like a northerner. And I'm like, what is a northerner supposed to look like? Um, <laughs> but in any case, I'm 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 fully northern. I'm I'm, um, I'm from Katsina. My mom is from Kogi. Um, um, I grew up most of my life in in Lagos, um, and then of course in England, and then Abuja, and then now back to Lagos. But I'm I'm fully northern, and and I think the the issues if I can call them issues, or the reason for the differences are largely cultural. Um, and I say cultural because some people mix that up with religion. The religion is a very, very um, um, uh, um, gender-friendly relig religion, believe it or not. It protects women. And they, it, it, they, the, it, this whole concept of Islam oppresses women is very wrong. Culture has come in and culture interpreted largely by men has come in and overtaken some, and, and imposed itself on some of these things to the point where people actually are unable to, to see the, the difference or to understand the difference and to actually extract those things that support women, obviously because of nature and the way we're built, there's some things a woman really cannot do physically. But certainly in terms of um, um, all the, there's nothing that stops a woman from going out and working. Yes, there are rules on modest dressing, but I think if you look at all the, uh, uh, um, all the fakes, all of them talk about modest dressing and modest behavior and all of that. So those things, let's leave, let's take all of that out. 
but culturally, um, women have tra have traditionally not um, uh, been allowed to to um, to express themselves or to go out into the workforce. So you'll find that um, even when a woman goes to um, school, has her degrees and all of that, and all her qualifications, she ends up. Um, and, and I see this in the North a lot, they usually end up more in government work because government work, the times are predictable. So she's able to go to work at eight, she's able to close at two or three, she's, you know, on a Friday, she will close at 12 and all of that. And that's because, um, the, um, you know, there's an expectation that she'll go back and, and run the home and, you know, uh, and, and do all of that. So um, traditionally, women in the North have tended to go more into government or civil service or, you know, those sort of, more um, structured, if I may call them, um, uh, professions. Um, I had a very brilliant uh, lawyer in Abuja, and she was excellent. She got a first in her university, um, first in law school, all of that. And she was working in one of the top firms in their Abuja office. And, and then um, I then ran into her like about a year later, and I said, oh, how's it going? Are you enjoying it? She goes, oh, no, you know, I've left. And I said, why? She said, well, my parents had a problem with me working until eight in the evening or even nine. And I called her mom. Her mom was like, ah, no, 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 no. It's too much. She got, I said, but you worked, um, auntie, you worked, you know, uh, all your life. She said, yeah, but I was in an organization, in a corporation. And, you know, I would be home by four. She, she can't do this. She's, she's a young, she's a She's young. She's. I was completely surprised. So, so this girl is now working, and I'm. I'm sure she's very happy. By the way, so please don't get me wrong. But she was happy to 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 move, and I think she's working in some um, non governmental organization or whatever. So, so those are the kinds of issues that 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 you come across. Now, I think you also touched on the fact that really, as far as um, the certainly the extreme north is concerned, there hasn't or there aren't a lot of firms that have set up any, um, uh, more of the more sort of um, uh, Southern style firms that do, a, they, they don't see that, they don't get the traction and the transactions that will allow them to be able to, um, um, to generate some of these high powered um, transactional uh, lawyers that we see. They tend to focus more on litigation and more run of the mill stuff. And it's just really a function of how the society is structured and what is available in those parts of, 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 of the country. And I've always said to, to my um, colleagues up north that, you know, there's nothing that stops you from collaborating with, with firms down south. Um, even if it's secondments, we're happy to take secondments so that people can come. Um, um, if I have a matter in Kano today, I don't want to go and set up office. I would rather have a firm that I know that I can collaborate with and that they will be able to render the same kind of professional um, advice that I would give down south. And so if that means giving some kind of umbrella support, uh, if we are doing it across Africa, why can't we do it with our people um, within our own borders? So. Yeah, that's... fantastic. Thank you so much, Ma. Yeah. Can I ask if we can steal 10 minutes of your time? We're running out of time, but I'd like to steal about 10, 15, 10. So we I'm end actually catching. I'm actually catching a flight. Ah, sorry. Okay. We will run through yeah, quickly. Yes, I, I goodness, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize we had, I didn't realize the time. We're had almost so there. So there's one question that someone yes. has asked, and I think it's important that we take it. Um, threats yes. um, as a female lawyer. So what had been, I think she's trying to say what has been the most threatening um, part of being um, a professional and maybe the challenges you faced um, and how younger lawyers can avoid them. I mean, I don't know, because she used the word threats. So what have been the threats yeah. you experienced as a female practicing lawyer and how we can work to avoid them? I just wanted to make sure we took a question from the house. And that's one. Okay, well, I'm not quite sure. Um, threat can mean many different things. Um, but if, if, if I, so I'll try and approach it from different perspectives. I think um, 
there's a threat to your uh, professional growth, which we've talked about, which is being looked down upon and not being recognized for giving the same services or, or um, um, that your male colleagues um, uh, um, uh, provide. There's a threat from um, um, intimidation, bullying, um, all manners of um, unwanted attention, if, if I can use that. And, um, you know, I, I think as a female, whichever profession you're in, people will, they, men will try it on. So, so you just have to be very professional. And that, and I go back to in your appearance, I'm not meaning to sound fickle, but in your appearance, in your demeanor, in your carriage, in your, um, in, in just generally how you present and comport yourself and being able to, um, extricate yourself from situations that make you uncomfortable. So it's about being brave. It's about speaking up. It's about calling things out and not necessarily even in a confrontational way. And even where you are unable to deal with things yourself, there's always somebody out there who can help you. So if you have a, a, an older person in the profession, a colleague, somebody you can talk to. And, 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 and I'm going to be a bit controversial now when I talk about threat, threats from other women. We need to support ourselves. Women need to help each other. Women generally tend to be threatened by other women. This, this thing is big enough for all of us. And if we help another woman to shine, we will shine. It does, they say if you help somebody light their candle, it doesn't dim your own light. So what we need to do is we need to be able to help each other. We need to support each other. You see the men, when they go, even when they're at a party, even when they're at an OMB, they're networking. You see people exchanging cards. They're taking details. They're talking about transactions they're talking about deals when we don't do that we don't do that so we have to be intentional about helping each other i have made it a point uh, this gender balance it's not just lip service for us our firm is split 50 50 in fact i think we have we have more female partners than we have male partners and certainly in terms of the associates <clears throat> excuse me we, it's it's a 50 50 split and i'm very intentional about that and we give the women as many opportunities. I remember we had to do, if you, if you remember from my team, we had to do some value for money audit, which required going to visit a client's uh, rig in the creeks, all of that. And they were like, ah, no, the women can't go. I said, why? I called the women. I said, which one of you wants to go? I got a few hands up and they went. So we, we have to give the opportunities and we have to support each other. The men are not going to do it for us. They, they, they're not. And they love it. They say, oh, you women, you know, now it's you people, you don't, you don't help yourselves. So we have to shame them. We have to shame them. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. That's such, that's such a big point. You've answered about four of my other questions with that Perfect. statement. So thank you. Perfect. Um, I think that, so we Perfect. have one of the veterans in the room, uh, Mrs. Fumi Roberts, and she has said in her oh. question, yes. Uh, and thank you yes. so much for joining us, Matt. We we, we really, really appreciate you taking the time to support us this morning. And she has said you should describe what success means to you. Um, say, from your perspective, in your 50s, 60s, 70s, what does success mean? So that we can aspire to that. So what would you define success as? Okay, well, uh, first of all, good morning, sis, uh, Stafumi. I think she's one of my favorite people. I admire her. She's very professional, very warm, very engaging. And when I first joined the, um, the SBL, she was one of the people that I looked up to many years ago. She may not know this, but um, I admire her a lot. And I think she's raised, if I'm not mistaken, three fine young gentlemen. I think it's three. Um, I, I could be wrong, but I know she's, she, she's raised some great um, young men. So I think success is something. And, and she supports other women aggressively. Absolutely. Ab absolutely 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 she she just you know she was she was very warm and, and welcoming when i when i joined um so i think success is something that is dynamic and success is something that um it, it's not really it, it it's it's evolutionary and so at different phases in your life you, um your your parameters of success are uh, uh, uh will change but I think ultimately it's, it's where you are able to um, 
really be comfortable in the steps that you've taken, um, learning from the lessons that you've learned, uh, that, that you um, from the experiences. I'm sorry that you that that you've had to encounter, and being at, and and knowing that you're not always going to get it right, but learning from those things and being able to rise to new challenges, um, and essentially being comfortable and at peace with those decisions that you've made. I know I've kind of waffled a bit, but that's because this came <laughs> out of the blue. And I, and I found that what I thought was success in my 20s is certainly not what I think is success in my 50s. But I think at this point in my life, if I'm able to be part of a firm or an organization that is that becomes a success story and we're able to leave a legacy and build an institution that survives its founding members, then I think for me at this point, that would be a good um, um, marker for success. Thank you so much, Ma. We're so grateful um, mm. for today. I have one question. So we, we went digging. We went digging mm. because many times people say women are not who they say, who they present themselves to be. So at work, yeah. they're great. And then, you know, privately, they're monsters and things like that. But we went digging yeah. and we heard gist about you. We said, we heard, what we heard was one, you leave a piece of you with everyone you meet. Two, you always buy gifts for people. Three, <laughs> you sent your driver to Mecca for Hajj. Four, <laughs> I'm sure you're wondering where we heard all of these things from. I, I'm thinking who are these I'm a boy. <laughs> <laughs> so the verdict, the verdict from everyone we engaged is that you are such a giver of love and light. And we want to know that you have left us with love and light this morning. We're so grateful to have heard your 32, 33, 35 year story crumbled into one hour. It's impossible to hear everything, but we're so grateful for this and we wish you all the best. We pray that you don't get tired. You're onto new things and we will continue to hear great, great, great things from you um, in the profession. Everyone is excited. We have so many, many people saying great things, but we need to let you go. So thank you so much, Ma, for obliging us today. Um, we will thank be knocking you. on your doors in the forum. We need you. Thank you so much for having me. It's honestly, like I said at the beginning, I'm humbled, I'm great. And feel free to reach out to me. My number is on, my, on our website, my email is there. Uh, but I'm really grateful for this opportunity and I hope that I've been able to, like you said, leave, leave you with some love and light. Um, that's my mantra and laughter as well in the process. So. Love, light, and laughter. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then. Thank you very so much. I will just hand over to uh, the head of the advocacy committee and Mrs. Um, o for final remarks. And then we are. Thank you, everyone. It's been a great honor anchoring this morning. Thank you so much, Oyeyemi. Um, thank you, Miss Aisha Rimi, for being open, um, for sharing your journey with us. Um, as she as Oyemi has said, um, trying to capture everything that you've gone through for the past 32 years and just sharing with us. We've been very inspired. Um, the chat box um, has been um, busting as well, you know, and the, the, the words that I'm taking back with me, even with my own years of practice, is that one, the patient, perseverance and prayers, and I think communication and never you know, pull any woman down, you know, let us help herself to shine. And that's the ultimate, you know, let us collaborate with each other and let us um, help ourselves to shine. Thank you so much. I, I believe that everyone on this um, session this morning has taken one or two things from you and has been inspired. And as we, as she said that uh, we we'll would always come to you again. Um, we really, really appreciate you spending this one hour with us. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate you. Um, Mrs. Okoracha, um, would you have anything to say before we close the session? <laughs> yes, thank, thank you, Tony. Uh, and thank you, Uye, for you know, handling that uh, session so expertly. And my sincere thanks go out to Aisha Rimi 
for really compressing 32 years of her career into just one hour. I'm sure that if she had more time to stay with us, um, there'll be so many questions from the floor. I had a couple I would have loved to ask, and uh, but uh, we are grateful for the, the nuggets and the tips that she dropped um, at that had me learning too. So thank you so much, Aisha. Um, thank you um, very I, much, Mrs. O. Yes, and, and um, we are very grateful and perhaps we'll come calling again. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to particularly talk about the question I saw on the group, which was to ask about the relationship, as it were, between MBA Women's Forum and FIDA. So I just wanted to uh, use this medium since I'm here, since I'm here and since that question was asked, to explain that uh, FIDA is an international organization with branches all over the world, and they have a chapter in Nigeria. I believe that uh, off the top of my head, their main focus is to help disadvantaged women and children uh, in society. Uh, it's, uh, and they offer pro bono services to ensure that the rights of women and children are looked after, be it offering pro bono litigation cases, cases of abuse, um, neglect, and so on and so forth for women and the female um, child. Um, and it's uh, an organization that has been standing for many years. Its impactful work is, is, has been on for, for, for many decades. And uh, it is a sister law organization uh, because MBA Women's Forum is also made up of lawyers. Now for MBA Women's Forum, uh, the Nigerian Bar Association Constitution uh, has a provision that um, enjoins the association to form uh, a particular forum for the female lawyer, recognizing that women in the bar need special attention. The headquarters of MBA Women's Forum is the Nigerian Bar Association. That is our parent body. And every female lawyer in Nigeria, whether you belong to FIDA or any other female association of lawyers, should be a member of the Women's Forum. Now, the difference is that our focus is in empowering the Nigerian female lawyer for success. And how can we be empowered? And where do we need empowerment? in our careers, in our professional life, in our personal life, whatever it is, we want to be empowered to be able to be a voice in society, to help us in our careers, to help us with work-life balance, to be mentored by women like Aisha, who have come to share inspiring stories, like Mrs. Fumi Roberts, who is here, you know, to hear their stories and to learn and to pick from it and be able to improve and impact ourselves so the focus of FIDA is completely different from the focus of the Women's Forum. In fact, a lot of our members are members of FIDA and there's no problem with that. Absolutely no problem with that. Um, we actually are planning a collaborative event in, a, in our annual general conference in March. The leadership of FIDA were there. They were on our panels, they spoke. We all spoke and we agreed that we'll be holding collaborative uh, events, you know, to try and make women or female lawyers understand that there is absolutely no competition between the two organizations. Every organization has their terms of reference and their focus, and our focuses are completely different. So whoever asked that question, I hope this explains it to you. MBA is enjoined to have a female branch that takes care of all the issues to do with female lawyers in Nigeria. Um, FIDA is an international organization. I do not, off the top of my head, remember where their headquarters are. My FIDA sisters, don't kill me. <laughs> you know, uh, but there is no issue whatsoever. I hope this puts it to rest. Um, and I hope that answers your question. Uh, once again, I wanna thank all the ladies who have joined us here today. Uh, thank you so much for coming on in this webinar. It was in, very uh, informative and inspiring for me.
I want to particularly thank Mrs. Fumi Roberts for joining us here today. Like I told you, Ma, I'm coming. No? <laughs> I always tell you that and I mean it. You will hear from us soon. Um, thank you, ladies, for coming. Again, don't forget to register. It's 5,000 if you're five years and above and absolutely free for all young lawyers. I should also, I think the advocacy desk will also, um, co committee, so you guys should mention there's a help desk housed in our advocacy committee. So if you have an issue in your career, you understand any type of problem, misconduct, whatever it is, uh, contact the advocacy committee's help desk and we deal with these issues. We have two or three we're dealing with now um, where we can intervene on behalf of our members. Remember, our motto is to empower the Nigerian female lawyer for success. So kudos to advocacy committee. Well done, uh, Tolu, Oyeyemi, Bukola, all of you your leadership, your members, we are proud of you. Thank you uh, for this impactful program. Thank you very much, Mrs. Okorocha. Um, we are glad to have you as our leader. And as she stated with the help Desk, the Advocacy Committee help Desk um, is a platform where we have developed for us to be able to help other female lawyers and all issues and complaints can be laid by members. So we receive uh, recording the incident of discrimination, unfair treatment at work, violence, abuse, harassment in the workplace, and society generally. Um, so we offer support and also lend a, um, a voice to issues um, that might be disturbing any female lawyer. So just feel free to um, send us an email or reach out to us. We'll be glad to be of help to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sokoricha, and also to uh, um, the anchor of this program, Oye Yemi Rigby and Dr. Bukola, I say kudos to you ladies. Um, let's do this oh, again. Sorry, Tolu, one last thing. I just wanted to mention that with the MBA annual conference coming up, MBA Women's Forum will be having their annual general meeting in Abuja. Uh, we are going to have a desk at the Friendship Center, is it? Or the exhibition stand. There will be a desk for MBA Women's Forum at the annual general conference of the MBA holding in Abuja. I think it's starting in less than two weeks. So look out for us. We're giving away a lot of memorabilia. We are, uh, we're launching our newsletter and we're also having an AGM. You can get free lunch at our desk. You know, so please come and find us, interact with us. All these membership questions, you can um, join on the spot. You know, so um, I just thought to add that. Over to you, Tolu. <laughs> Back to okay. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kuracha. Uh, we look forward to having um, female lawyers at the um, MBA and our conference, which is starting next week on the 24th. Um, so, um, yes. So thank you, everyone, um, for joining us. I'm sure that you have been inspired to have a lovely day and you've taken one or two tips from here today. Um, please look forward to our next edition, which we'll be sharing with you. Till then, enjoy your day and thank you very much.